good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by Media Tech Labs, and it's called From Concept to Consumer, Making Your Idea a Commercial Reality. This is the first in a series of webinars that we'll be hosting over the next coming months, and we, we, we'll be covering all, all topics um, that will help get your IoT idea prototype to hopefully commercial reality. Um, today we have two guest speakers in addition to our Media Tech Lab speaker. Um, we have a speaker from uh, Cambridge Wireless and we also have a speaker from Flextronics. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand you over to um, today's presenters, um, who is Ed Kay from Media Tech Labs and Obi from uh, Cambridge Wireless and Lindsay O'Regan from Flextronics. Thanks, Michael. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome from a foggy Cambridge this morning. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear us very clearly. Um, so, this is, as Michael said, this is going to be a, uh, a series of uh, webinars, webisodes, if you like, um, with an overarching theme of how we can accelerate your idea of becoming a commercial reality. Um, the, um, the presentation will be available as a download um, at the end. Uh, maybe, maybe a few minutes after we finish, um, so um, so that's that should be fine. As as Michael said, please put your questions into the um, the dashboard, the WebEx dashboard, and we'll try as we can in the time we have. And if not, um, we will um, follow up with them afterwards. So, no further ado, um, we'll start with a bit of background. Um, just a tiny bit of history, this is a nice slide that we, we used at the okay. It's not a new a new um, a new concept. The the kind of little thing on the left is actually an abacus ring that was used in China in the seventeenth century, um, which enabled the bean counters to keep without actually right you know, wearable technology has been around for three, four hundred years. Um, and nowadays, you know, we, we've announced some new chips in the last uh, few months, uh, 2523 and the 2511, which bring a lot more kind of uh, power to, to kind of affordable wearable technology uh, with kind of um, biosensors and really kind of cost effective systems on chips. Um, as we've kind of shifted from the 90s to the current uh, and, and onwards into the future, what we're seeing is really a fundamental shift in the scale and scope of, uh, of computing uh, and the focus of it. So the 90s really it was focused around the single entity, the, the PC, the, the work PC, the home PC, um, and that was the single kind of computing unit that you had. Um, we moved into the uh, the 21st century, and with the mobile internet, we've started to have multiple devices that people are wearing around around them. The mobile internet, and that kind of multiplied the kind of computing base by maybe a factor of 10. But as as we all know, uh, with the internet of things, promising connectivity, connectivity, homes, cars, healthcare. Um, industrial uses, um, the, the number of opportunities is, is looking to, to explode. And while I don't like using those big hockey curve charts that we see, um, you know, where people are quoting 50 billion units by 2020, uh, all those sort of things, we do know that there's going to be a large uh, explosion in the number of sensing devices and computing devices. Um, so that's kind of where the opportunity lies for. Um, and as new devices come in, um, there are new applications and new services that need to be built. Um, the more connected devices, then the more opportunities there are for us to, um, to use big data. Um, and we'll be talking about big data in a future web, web, uh, webinar. Um, and basically using a lot of services that even today, I think that there'll be services that we haven't considered that will, will come into play in the next few years. Um, our, our opportunity really is to 
leverage a mobile solution and ecosystem that already exists um, in the smartphone world. Um, we have uh, a big developer community that, all, that I mean, I've just come to the smartphone world today, uh, have come from a smartphone background. Um, and what we're trying to do is open standard. Um, available. Um, the mobile experience, the things that it brings to uh, the wearable and IoT world are that it's obviously it's wireless, um, it's always connected, um, so you're always collecting data, um, and it's multimedia rich, so there is a, a, a good degree of focus, which is really, really kind of a maybe overlooked but quite crucial kind of area, especially when we talk about wearable technology and the use of, of data and matching up different data sources. Um, the other thing that um, the IoT brings to bear is the economic scale. It's, it's an order of magnitude more than um, the number of smartphones that are available. And so we're really talking about very high performance, greater than we've seen for any technology before. Um, and really bringing a lot of diverse capabilities and functionalities into a single single um, single unit. Um, yeah, I mean, and you can even see that down to the scale of systems on chips that have um, lots of different connectivities all in one small uh, piece of silicon. Um, in media tech, one of the things that we look at are the verticals. So we're really looking at the uh, focusing on a number of verticals. Um, uh, namely, we've got six listed here. These, these are the big kind of overarching verticals. We, we often drill down deeper into uh, individual kind of use cases within there. Um, however, the, the ones that we, we find um, are really interesting at the moment, smart home, smart city, um, healthcare, they're, they're ones that are really kind of um, jumping out at us at the moment. Um, wearable technology, obviously, um, is a vertical, but also horizontal, and it cuts across some of these as well. Um, but as with all new technologies, there are some major challenges. Um, the three that we kind of see as the big problems at the moment, or three opportunities for us to um, take advantage of, um, can we integrate with existing standards? Can we work with new standards? Um, and and are the devices capable of supporting many of these different standards? Um, business models. Um, right now, I think there's a challenge developing monetizations um, and building an ecosystem based on that. And security. Um, security, I think, is probably the overarching number one um, challenge that we have at the moment, and what we're looking at is um, both companies like companies kind of new new methods, such as biometrics and things like that, that can really under underpin the uh, security going forward. And my my kind of message is to really jump into a security as a um, as a kind of a second case, it really needs to be considered as part of your primary function. Um, a little a quick kind of slide on an example of when people talk about security. Um, here's some just examples of where we think there's there are some security challenges. Um, so there are particular potential vulnerabilities. Um, on the theme of controlling things. So in a smart home, you might have control, someone take control of locks or lights, for instance, or in a car, maybe unlock your doors or uh, remotely. Or even we've, we've seen kind of uh, cases of um, kind of uh, bio, bio devices such as pumps, uh, insulin pumps that may be hacked. Um, theft theft is, is kind of the obvious thing that you think of with security. Um, you know, where people can maybe then unlock the door and go inside and steal your your, your private possessions, or they can uh, get access to other systems in, in your vehicles. Um, um, and of course, you know, if you've got a Fitbit or something 
like that. If that gets hacked, then um, you've got um, people under, uh, knowing where you are at any time, which I think uh, is obviously uh, something you, you don't necessarily want in a security situation. And um, the final one is, is really disruption, which is just the richest kind of makers who might just feel that they want to kind of disrupt your daily existence, you know, infecting your your fridge with uh, malware so that it, it defrosts all your all your food. Sounds sounds kind of um, minor, but actually, you know, if that keeps happening, it's, it's going to be a serious problem. Hacking vehicle systems is obviously uh, not not going to be a good thing, and um, we know that pacemakers uh, can be vulnerable to this sort of disruption as well. So security, I think, is a real real challenge, and with that Definitely, kind of um, uh, uh, really encourage people to include security as, as a kind of a primary feature in their, their solutions. Um, talking about solutions as a as a hardware organisation, one of the things we're really interested in doing is is, is um, coaching people on how how you can through some simple steps make your life easier when you're talking about prototyping and then going on to to manufacturing. Um, first um, little tip would be think about compliance and real-world testing. Um, so, um, so compliance is a particular um, uh, difficulty, especially when we're talking about things like medical systems, where compliance may change in different parts of the world. Um, obviously, security, we should just mention power requirements, things like that, regional regulations, certification, they're all um, may be different in different parts of the world um, and may be very hard to achieve. Um, and the testing that falls out off the back of that, I think, is also kind of um, critical. That um, particular subject on compliance and certification falls into maybe the theme of the day, I think, which is the, the value of the ecosystem. And, you know, there are a number of companies that, that we work with, um, both, both as media centers and through company, uh, organizations like Cambridge Wireless um, that can help with areas like compliance and uh, some of these regional uh, regulations and kind of legal situations. So some of this is actually not necessarily a technical uh, issue. It may be a um, commercial or a legal or a compliance issue as well. In terms of ma manufacturing, it's worth understanding how to make things easier for the manufacturing partner. So, uh, you know, if you're building something that in, sort of relies on an entirely new to make mass, uh, you know, volumes of, of your product, then having that conversation with the manufacturer early um, and maybe thinking about alternatives so that you can essentially even use off-the-shelf materials that are, that are mature, well-known and, and have um, kind of manufacturing processes already around them. That can make it a lot easier and accelerate the time to market. Um, industrial merchandising, all, this, all the things we're talking about um, over the next few months, they're all new products, they're new categories, they're new form factors. So the merchandising that goes with it is a bit untested. There's some, you know, some basic kind of marketing kind of techniques and things like that. But we're talking about categories of devices that, that haven't existed before. So some of this is a bit of a step to the unknown. But it's definitely worth thinking. And support. So, um, you know, as we move into the era of wearables and smart clothing, for instance, um, you're going to start to find pieces of clothing that you buy that actually come with a support hotline. Um, now, in the past, you've never needed to have a support hotline for, your, for a pair of socks. But if you've got a smart Um, and
accessible to you. Uh, because we enable a billion devices uh, every year, so we've got the scale, we've got the kind of um, the roadmap of of chips and systems that can support a lot of the solutions that you may be looking at. Um, just an example of a few of the MediaTek powered products that you may have seen. Um, so Omate is a uh, smartwatch manufacturer. Um, the Kindle Fire, which is a kind of a well-known tablet, uh, Sony's Android smart TVs, um, and a number of different smartphones have uh, been released with MediaTek chips in there. Um, and where do we see our role in the value chain? Um, really, we're in the things. We're, we're, we're a hardware organization. We provide um, silicon that can power, um, connect different things together. Um, so that side of things. We don't see ourselves as the entire uh, value chain. Um, and what, what, we, well, what we do do is we work very closely with ecosystem partners to provide the additional kind of capabilities that you might need um, to, to accelerate your solution. And um, on that topic, I think it's, it's a good time to hand over to um, a couple of, um, of, of guests and colleagues who have joined us from Cambridge Wireless and Flex. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Obi from Cambridge Wireless. We'll just do a little bit of a, a background as to the value of the ecosystem. Okay, thank you, Ed and Michael. I'd like to thank uh, uh, MediaTek Labs uh, for this great opportunity. And I um, just want to say hi to you all out there. Uh, I think it's really exciting, actually, all right, uh, what MediaTek Labs are doing in partnership with Flex, uh, Cambridge Wireless, and all our ecosystem members as well. Uh, IoT is a really interesting space. It can be a bit of a hype for some people. So actually navigating your way, if you're a startup or a more established organization into this, um, you know, great market opportunity can be a bit challenging. So what we're trying to do uh, collectively is to offer you support and drive innovation. So with uh, CW, or Cambridge Wireless as we're there, is um, we're a not-for-profit organization. And really our mission is to help our members to network, uh, learn, and grow. And uh, particularly with the startup community, is to help them scale and be successful. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. And you know, get the members to help each other. So the slide I'm, uh, I'm at the moment now is actually just a snapshot of some of our, our members uh, within the um, uh, within the network. What you find here is that um, we actually have quite a few uh, here. And if you look here, right in the middle there, you know, powering a lot of these devices and connectivity is MediaTek, MediaTek Labs. And we've got other uh, uh, chipset companies too. And then as you move out from the box, you've got the connected devices. And then you've got a lot going on there from content, big data, um, secure networks. We work closely with the network operators. But actually where we're seeing a lot of momentum and excitement is around infrastructure IoT and the verticals, that, as Ed mentioned, from members organizations such as British Gas, uh, Network Rail, Automotive. And, you know, what we're seeing and feeling is that um, there's a lot of energy excitement there, but also a lot of questions about, okay, look, how can we uh, take advantage of what's happening in the IoT, people flying around, how can you monetize that data, and how can you make everything connect together and work? Uh, I think what's, what's interesting is you're going to see a lot of uh, collaborations and partnerships uh, going on uh, with a lot of these organizations as they're trying to figure it all out the opportunity for startups to come into this space and apply different business models and new technologies is really interesting. And again, with MediaTek Labs and uh, Flex and other partners too, the ability to scale up from a concept to a product to taking it out, manufacturing, channels to market, um, there's a lot of navigating to do, and this is where we can help. So I'm just going to point to you uh, to the last slide So as, uh, as long as uh, with our members, we're also working very closely with universities and their accelerators and incubators. So example here is UCL, uh, Imperial Innovations, and uh, uh, we have the University of Cambridge too. We work with consultancies, uh, law firms as well. Because something to consider here in IoT is, you know, as uh, Ed mentioned, is data and security and IP. 
and with lots of data um, uh, actually uh, traveling around right? and, and the user experience around that data, there are questions in terms of who owns this data and how secure is it. We're also working with uh, the government as well and government initiatives. So I guess the message here is um, in the world of IoT, um, it's great depending on where you are, um, either as a startup or you're a, a very large organization. But what we're finding is even the larger organizations want to engage with the startup community to drive the innovation and collaborate and partner. And the ability to scale up from concept to product and take it into larger volumes, hopefully as you grow the organization, that's where you really need, I believe, the support of big organizations and very innovative organizations like MediaTek Labs and Flex or Flextronics. Certainly at Flex, who can take you uh, from there. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks very much, Obi. Um, uh, I want to thank Michael and Ed for giving us this opportunity to participate this morning and uh, say good morning to everybody listening and thank them very much for uh, being on the call. The good news is that the number of attendees has not gone down since the start of the call, so hopefully that means everybody's getting something good out of it. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, nothing technical. Uh, it's to do more with the human and financial capital involved with uh, building an ecosystem. Um, before I start into that, just let me quickly explain a little bit about uh, Flex. By the way, you, we used to be Flextronics, but now we're very definitely uh, Flex. And we are one of the largest outsourced supply chain uh, management companies in the world. And uh, last year, our turnover was $26 billion. We have 200,000 employees and rising in 100 different sites in 30 different uh, countries. And if you look at the markets in which we uh, participate, we've uh, spread across most of, the, uh, most of the electronics markets in the world and even some non-electronics products as well. We're no longer just restricted to electronics, which is why we dropped the Flextronics. And probably out of all those segments there, the one that's moving, rising the fastest is almost certainly uh, wearables. So um, uh, last year, Flex produced about 85% of the world's wearable products. Now, uh, that's enough about us, because today is not about uh, Flex, it, it's about you. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is, um, is the ecosystem. And just to explain, I work for the part of Flex which concentrates on innovation and helping customers uh, make successes of their products. And what that means is that I spend about 80% of my time directly with innovators, uh, with startup organizations. And I've been doing that for about four years now. And uh, over that time, uh, what I've been able to do is observe trends in behavior amongst innovators, uh, uh, which give me a, uh, a good pointer towards the, the differences between those which will uh, be successful first time round and those which may be need another go at it. So I want to share with you today some of the observations I've made from uh, working closely with those companies over a period of time. So to start with, let's have a look at uh, how, how we would think of an ecosystem so we know what we're talking about. And essentially, uh, the, the, the um, breaks down into these four areas. If you look at the first two, cultivate and develop, what we're talking about there is putting in place the human and the financial capital that, that's actually going to enable uh, uh, innovation. And then building in the second stage, the development, all the, the basic building blocks, they're going to help people get products developed and uh, ready for market as quickly as possible. And this is kind of sector independent. So although we're talking today about IoT, it can apply across almost uh, any segment. So whatever your particular interest and your particular project this will apply to you just as well as anybody else. Uh, once you've got that, those building blocks in place, if you can then make them industry specific, which is the identify section, 
then you give yourself a chance of uh, getting the product to market and uh, and, and commercialising it. And um, that's really when the excitement starts. Uh, just a couple of points here. It's important when you're building a, uh, uh, a an ecosystem to get the right balance, the right number of partners. You don't want too few. If you become dependent on uh, one, then uh, uh, and then all of a sudden that relationship isn't as great as it used to be. You could be in a tricky situation. You don't want too many either. Um, the more you've got, the greater the risk of um, uh, a lack of coherence amongst your uh, your ecosystem partners, and the harder it is for you to manage. So, the thing the thing that works best with the companies I've worked with is when they build an ecosystem based upon a team rather than a ser- rather than a group of uh, stellar individuals. It's very much like a sporting. There is a good sporting analogy here because when you put your ecosystem together, all those partners will need to interact well together. And if you fragment your ecosystem into too many different subcategories and pick a subject matter expert in each one of them, you run the risk that they they, they will not play well together as a team. So that's the important thing there. Now, if I look at the, the specific themes that uh, that go all, run all the way through building an ecosystem, uh, let's talk about these things. So, when I was when I was thinking of what it was that binds them all together, event, uh, uh, so that I could put this presentation together, eventually this is what came to mind. Now. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but uh, one of the things that makes me sad about the passing of vinyl, although it's making a comeback now, but the passing of vinyl to be replaced with CDs and now MP3s is the loss of what I think is one of the great art forms, which is uh, the album album sleeve design. And this was one of my favorites, and it's what came to mind when I was thinking of the theme here. But uh, don't worry, the theme is not moody or blue. It's really a question of balance. And uh, when you put in an ecosystem together, it needs to be well balanced. And in particular, in my experience, these are the areas where uh, balance becomes is most important. So I'm going to talk in uh, over the next few minutes about how I see balance working in each of these categories. So first, if we look at relationships, what am I what am I thinking by balance? Well, first of all, it needs to be symbiotic. That means particularly it's a partnership of equals. So whenever you're picking a partner, you need to make sure that they're just as thrilled at working with you as you are with them. And that can be a couple of things. So you might find, for example, that if you're working with a smaller company, it's easy to develop a close personal relationship. If you're working with a larger company, you can still develop close personal relationships, but you should you need to find the right locations within those larger companies to make sure that your partners are always those that value working with you. Technical competence is obviously important in whatever the subject matter is, but it's also important that they are easy to do business with. Um, If you find the relationship gets strained because the two of you clash in some way, it's going to slow you down. It may damage the, the output that you get and may jeopardize your chances in the marketplace. And typically, when speed is important, it's usually easiest safest and wisest to work with partners who are close at hand. That usually means from within the same culture and probably within the same geography. Um, It's possible, of course, to work with partners who are thousands of miles away, but it can make life a lot harder and the project a lot slower. So where speed matters, stay local is my recommendation. So, in terms of planning, now, this is not what anybody sets out with, 
the intention of developing as a project plan, but this is sometimes where it ends up, and it ends up there for some specific reasons. And uh, in terms of building an ecosystem, here are some of the things that can lead you there. So there is a danger, and I have seen it happen, where uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, focus so much effort on the development of the product itself that they don't think far enough down the supply chain to make sure that they've got every aspect of what uh, of success covered. And not only that, then sometimes only think about the launch of the product and not how they're going to take it through the entire product, the, the entire life cycle. And both of those things are very important, and I'm going to explore them in a little more detail in a moment. And the key point is this, that when you, when you build your ecosystem and when you develop your plan, you will not be able to eliminate risk. The question is not how do you eliminate risk. The question is how do you minimize it and then figure out how to handle it. So, for example, when a skydiver jumps out of an aeroplane, he has not eliminated risk. He's exposed himself to great risk. But he's figured out what the risk is and how to ha and how to manage it, which is why most of the time, thankfully, they land safe and sound on the ground. The key point is this: that it, the better you plan and the further ahead you can plan, the more of the project you can plan at the outset, the fewer surprises you'll experience down the line. I'll explore some of those in, in a moment. So the key message is no surprises. So let me consider the product life cycle. I guess everybody's familiar with this chart, but five stages of the product life cycle, develop, launch, grow, maturity, and uh, end of life. And you will notice from the, uh, uh, the points made underneath each section there, each phase, that you, you will have different priorities at different stages in the product life cycle. And what that probably means is that you will work with different partners because it's very unlikely you're going to find a single company that will be uh, excellent in all aspects of the product life cycle. So you're probably going to work with multiple companies. What that means is you need to have a collaboration across them and at an early stage. Let me give you an example. So um, if I look at the, I'm going to jump to the highest phase, maturity, what, where the market objective is maintain brand loyalty. I'll give you an example of a project I became familiar with through talking to a design company not long ago. They had a customer who was a big company. Uh, but wanted to move into a new area where they had no experience. So they were smart enough to partner with a design company to develop the hardware product uh, for that market. And they did it very well. It was a big success. They developed, launched, and ramped up very quickly, very effectively, and then got into volume production. At that point, the design company said to me, it turned out that logistics was more complex and more difficult than the engineering. What the company found when they got to that point was they were finding it difficult to react to changing, changing levels of demand to get product out into the market quickly enough, to do it economically enough. And when product failed, they had no mechanisms in place for handling returns and repairs. They got no uh, policy and no plans for providing service parts and so on. And what they found very quickly was that although the market was enthusiastic about the product, they ended up disappointed in the company's performance. And so though the product is still in the market, it's not nearly the uh, selling at the levels that, e that the company had hoped. And the reason for that was simply because they did not consider logistics and distribution and aftermarket services early enough in the process. Um, so it's really, really important to plan all the way through the process as early as you can. 
It's also important to plan each stage in the life cycle well and as early as you can. If you look at the graph there, what it shows is a nice smooth curve and a nice smooth progression from one section to the, from one phase to the next. It is not automatic that that will happen. It can be different to that. And in particular, when you go from development to launch and from launch to growth, and from growth to volume manufacturing, you might find that you're transferring between partners. And when you transfer between partners, there is a risk that you might stumble. And if you stumble, that will lead to delay in the, uh, in the curve. You won't get the smooth growth. You'll get a pause. You'll get a gap. And that gap represents three things. It represents disappointed customers. It represents an opportunity for competitors, and it represents to you no cash flow. And no cash flow, particularly if you're a small organization and particularly if it's early in the process, can be the difference between staying in business and not. So understand, uh, one important thing to understand is that when you transition between partners, particularly if you're transitioning between phases, you need to understand how that transition is going to work and plan for it to work smoothly before it happens. So the the um, overlying the, uh, the the overarching importance there is to recognise where risk might exist and plan for it so that you can handle it and thereby minimise it. So the third of the areas where I thought the balance is, is important is uh, on the subject of project priorities. When the people I'm working with enter into a project, these are the three things that they're always that, that are always on their minds, and they're always trying to keep in balance. So quality, time, and finance. Now, so if your focus is on time and you rush to get a product out to market by a given date and it's unrealistically aggressive, you may find the product quality isn't as complete as you would hope it would be. And they, nobody wants to end up in a position where the first thing that happens is you get huge success and great demand for your product. And the second thing that happens is that a lot of those products come back because they've failed in the field. Um, not clever for anybody. On the other hand, if you concentrate too much on quality, you might find that you're uh, that you're using more time than you than you than you need to. You might find you're too late into the market. An example would be a customer I worked with uh, had developed a product with LEDs in it, and different colours on the LEDs meant different states. So one was meant to be blue, and one was meant to be orange. And uh, what happened was that he, when he developed the product, he found that orange was showing as blue and blue was showing as orange now nobody in the world apart from him knew that or thought that was a problem because blue and orange weren't important different was what was important and they were different when he did field tests with the product customers were perfectly happy that they with the orange and the blue as they were but he decided that it was not as ha as he had intended it to be and so he decided he'd spend time getting it right. So he spent another nine months making blue, blue, and orange, orange. And by the time that he'd done so, he found somebody else had got into the market and his position was, his opportunity was much less than he'd hoped it would be. And yet, neither quality nor time is really the actual, the important driver. Finance is the real driver. Now, why do I say finance is the real driver? Here's why. Here's what tends to happen with organizations that don't raise enough funding. They kind of say to themselves, here's the amount of money I've got, and so... Whatever work I need doing has to be done within that amount of money. And that typically what they do is they persuade themselves that actually that is enough money and they can get the work done for that amount of money. And when that happens, many things can happen. First of all, they end up with a suboptimal partner choice 
uh, and you find that quality ends up getting compromised, you can find that there is a delay in the project happening. Sometimes it can take so long that the company fails in the process. So I'll give you an example. The longest delay I had between a customer uh, coming to me uh, for a particular kind of work and going away when he found um, our quote too expensive and him being sure that he could actually get the work done for a much lower cost elsewhere and then coming back because it hadn't worked was 18 months so we gave a quote the customer didn't like it because he found a, a lower cost elsewhere and anyway we were above what he could afford he went away and came back again 18 months later still with no product in the market so the Two points here. When you are assessing the, uh, the, the the relative cost of different partners, you need to assess two things. First, what they will charge you. And second, the opportunity cost associated with the relative time in the market of getting you into the market. And so in that example, being delayed by 18 months into the market cost that company a lot of money. And they ended up folding as a result. I, I really can't stress this enough, and it, it it's absolutely vital to make sure that you have enough funding. And uh, I, I would say that more projects in which I've been involved fail because the comp the, uh, the the entrepreneur was underfunded than for any other reason. Uh, and there are various ways of raising finance. Some uh, there are obviously venture capitalists. Uh, but you can also consider crowdfunding. Sometimes uh, partners uh, will be happy to invest in you. Sometimes customers will be happy to invest in you. And as with all things, what the the trick is to manage a balanced funding. All right, but here's the real deal. So. It's not just about uh, balancing those things because the project is not just about those things. The project is really about you, the innovator, you, the entrepreneur. And the uh, any potential partner whose own success depends on your success is going to ask you this kind of question. This is how I ask it to my, to my prospects. So they need to be moving forward on an equal footing in terms of products, customers, and finance. And uh, when I talk to customers and they give me an answer and it's a balanced answer, so the product is progressing, they've got customers close to signing up, and they have uh, funding to get them through stage by stage, then there's a good chance they're going to make a success of it. And any partner or any investor is going to be judging not just the quality of the product, but also the likelihood that the person who owns the product is going to bring it to market. So that's absolutely critical. I recommend that you be asking yourself those questions at all times, not just so that you're read, <coughs> excuse me, ready when somebody like me asks you it, but also because it's important to your own development. So quick summary, find partners you can trust and work with that, they're as in, that you're as important to them as they are to you. And if you've got them and enough funding, then you've got a chance. And uh, thanks for listening, and let me wish you all very good luck. So, we're on the home stretch. Thanks for staying with me. Um, so, um, who are Media Tech Labs in, in all of this um, mass of, kind of ecosystems and partners and, and companies like that? You've just heard from uh, Cambridge Wireless, talking about the, the ecosystem in general. Uh, really good points from Lindsay on um, Flex's kind of uh, um, insights into what what constitutes um, really kind of the, the foundation for uh, developing your solution. And really, MediaTek Labs is all about helping you go from an idea to a prototype to a product, uh, working alongside companies like Flex and uh, organizations like uh, Media Tech, uh, Cambridge Wireless. Um, the um, Media Tech Labs itself, we're a free global program. Um, you can join, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, you can add solutions in there. Um, we support developers in device creation, 
developing your applications and services. Um, really, we think we're a, a really good solution partner for IoT development. Um, we supply the hardware. Um, we have advanced systems on chips. Um, really, kind of cutting edge uh, development um, environments. Um, lots of designs for kind of worldwide adoption. Different connectivity solutions. Um, and um, if you have a look at some of the recent releases that we've had, especially in the smartphone area. Um, really kind of leading multimedia uh, capabilities as well. Um, the, um, the portfolio of, of development boards that we have um, to get you guys up and running as quick as possible, uh, we have the Linkit One, which is really hugely connected uh, device. It's based on the Arduino. Um, we use a, a MediaTek 2502 chip, which is an ARM7 running about 250 megahertz. Um, and it has um, pretty much most of the connectivity you can you could wish for on there. So you can try out different technologies, different connectivity solutions to see which one works best for you in terms of performance, bandwidth, power consumption, things like that. Um, the Linkit Assist 2502, really that one is, is very similar to the Linkit One, but it's, it also um, has a capacitive touchscreen and really designed for professional developers to work on wearable form factors, uh, smart watches and maybe smart badges, or or even kind of uh, clothing with a with a screen attached. Um, we have a Linkit Connect 7681, which is a very simple way to Wi-Fi enable your devices. Um, the new uh, members of the, the family are the um, Smart 7688 and the 7688 Duo. Um, these are very um, cost friendly um, devices. I think the 7688 is $11 or $12 and the 7688 is about $16. Um, and these devices are really uh, very well um, suited for um, connecting IoT with Wi-Fi. Um, there's a lot of uh, support for, um, for developers who are moving into this area. So Python Node.js is supported. Um, runs on OpenWRT um, and also um, the Duo supports uh, Arduino ID as well. Um, what can you do with it? Well, it's, it's really designed, as I said, with Wi-Fi in mind for the connected home. So IP cameras, security cameras, uh, connected devices, um, home hubs, things like that. Um, quite powerful. It's running about 500 meg. Um, I'll flick through the next few slides. As I said, this, these slides will be available for you to download, so the data that's included here, uh, as you can see on this list, uh, I won't go through every, every point here. Uh, but as you can see, just to pick out a couple of, um, a couple of, kind of headlines, um, 128 meg of RAM, 32 meg flash, and running at 500 meg, 580 megahertz. Um, there's some uh, 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 examples of the what the boards look like. Um, to give you a sense of the size of that, that board, it, it's basically about the size of a stick of chewing gum. Um, and as I said, the platform it runs on is OpenWRT, so it's an open source uh, running on the Chaos Karma um, flavor, and um, it has been uh, built into it, and then uh, providing kind of application support through a Node.js, Python, C, and Arduino. Um, more software specifications, uh, the platform uh, supported languages, and if you need more info, uh, labs.mediatech.com, get all the documentation, tool chains, uh, bootloader, and the firmware as well. Final thing that we just wanted to quickly touch on, and this goes back a little bit to the, um, the ecosystem message. Um, a lot of people that we, we speak to have come from a smartphone uh, software background, and they think that uh, building an IoT solution is as simple as building their, solution, their software, throwing it over the bench, and it just, just work. Um, unfortunately, in the world of IoT, um, hardware rears its ugly head, so we've got a lot of uh, more complicated kind of um, value chains to, to consider. Um, so, with that in mind, we've actually created a thing called MediaTek Labs Park Connect. Um, and that, this, this helps us um, help the developer community to really 
uh, identify the different components within the value chain that suit their particular solution and accelerate their time to market. And this, this follows on precisely from some of the things that Lindsay was talking about earlier. Um, it allows us to really kind of go from an idea where you've got the, board, the developer board, um, build a platform up through the developer community, access, um, prototyping, and then we connect with our distributors, our ODMs and our OEMs, and then you can productize it. And then um, our, through our value chain, we have the ability to help with distribution as well. Um, I know there's been a question on how do we get funding um, that came through uh, earlier. Um, so I just wanted to add this slide in here. So one of the things that we do offer is we have a, a part of the business called MediaTek Ventures who have a pot of money um, ready to invest in, in potential um, companies that, that are interesting. Um, their, their, their focus is on six particular areas. Uh, that are listed here, and as you can see, Internet of Things, um, healthcare, their, um, software and internet services, they're things that kind of really resonate with the IoT community. So if you're interested, um, there's a, a URL below, www.mediatechventures.com, or you can send an email to ventures at mediatech.com. If, um, if you mentioned that you kind of saw, saw, uh, saw this in, the, uh, in, a, in a webinar from MediaTech Labs, then that might give you a little bit of a, um, an acceleration into that organization as well. If not, if you email us directly, then we can, um, we can form some introductions with the venture team. So in summary, um, what we're really about, um, both Cambridge Wireless, uh, Flex, and MediaTek today, we've been talking about enabling IoT and wearable innovation and how we can kind of accelerate your um, your ideas through to a commercial product. So point one, a bit cheeky, but if you work with MediaTek, then we can help to um, provide uh, solutions that move you from prototyping to commercial products. And we would encourage you to work with the ecosystem, um, you know, so Cambridge Wireless, Flex, and uh, there's, there's quite a few companies that we, we can put you in touch with who can provide expert kind of advice and solutions in particular areas where you might have challenges. Um, uh, the function, so I would say don't, don't build um, a solution, uh, don't create a problem just to say you have a solution for it. Um, so really, you should be building things that are based around solution, uh, problems that already exist. Um, keep manufacturing in mind, make it easy for yourself and for the manufacturer to, um, to, to build a process that can deliver you um, a mass market product um, and as I said off the shelf can often reduce time and risk. Um, bear in mind real world reliability and compliance. Um, consider, a, consider regulations um, that are factored in. Build it for real world use, so washability if it's wearable or you know power management, things like that. Make security an integral feature. Um, it's really going to be one of the primary things this year I think. And consider how you want to monetize this. It may be that you, you think it'll just work in standard model that, that works with smartphone apps or things like that, but that might not be the case. So really have a long think about the monetization side of it. Um, the next steps are register at MediaTek Labs, um, where you can download all the SDKs that are free. Uh, we have another webinar um, in a month's time where we'll be looking uh, in more detail at uh, one part of the value chain, and this one will be looking at big data and IoT, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, what should we do with it. Um, if you have any questions, then the URL there will let you uh, email them to the uh, MediaTek Labs forum. So thanks for listening. Um, if there are any questions um, that we haven't answered already, then um, Lindsay, Obi and I are still still here. I don't think we've got very much time, but if there's any pressing things we can answer in, in the next couple of minutes, then uh, send them through. If not, then um, please email them to us and we can 